All right. So I'm starting to bring in reference. I'm, I start with the cranium of the head. And then, you know, the mandible that will go onto that cranium. I can bring that in and I can immediately rough cut with as much overlap as the reference will allow for this jaw that's going to go on that cranium. Duplicate it, Command-J. Delete that smart object, which is way bigger than I need. And then I do that sometimes. Option-Command-T, because we're in Photo P, not Photoshop, to get to free transform and shrink it down. And then now I have two layers. And that cranium is the static one. That's the one I want to find the reference at the right angle. But the mandible is the dynamic one. It's the one that I can really mess with and get to fit with that cranium. So not only can I, you know, change its size and rotate it like I have, what I want to do is actually warp it and fit it onto this skull. Kind of push and pull it, can change its expression. It's a lot of fun because it's all organic. And like playing with Silly Putty, I can get it to kind of work as my snout for my zipper rumper zoo. Want to pinch it a little bit at the top? I can do that. I'm going to line it up on those eyes. All right. And then if I want to rough cut it a little bit more, I can always just roughly go around it and trim it, but I'm not doing any kind of clean cutting out until I also mess with the color and the adjustments. Now I'm going to bring in the eyes. And actually, maybe I want these eyes. I like how wide set these owl eyes are. So I'm going to immediately flip it and then I'm going to, going to rough cut out with a lot of overlap. These eyes. My first college drawing class, we had a project where we were drawing in charcoal taxiderm birds and I chose a snowy owl and I had to draw that owl for like 96 hours or something. It was ridiculous. So I'm having a little PTSD looking at this owl's eyes, but. That's what I chose with owl eyes. <laughs> but they're cool. They are cool. All right, so that is kind of funny looking, but I need to make it match the cranium, right? Doesn't mean I need to put them in the same place as the original eyes. In fact, I like these ones because they're goofy and wide set. But I can warp and kind of pinch and pull and set them so that they feel believable on that angle of the cranium. And this is getting there. So that this back eye isn't quite as large as this eye is in front. All right, so now I've got a head made out of three pieces. And then I have the ears. Bum -ba -dum -ba -dum. And again, I'm going to rough cut it with my lasso with a lot of overlap. Even though I'm just using the ears. Duplicate, Command-J, delete the smart object because it's taking tons of memory and it's going to slow you down. And then Option, Command-T to free transform it. And I run this one behind my cranium, whereas the eyes and the, uh, the muzzle, the nose, went in front. The ears are going to go behind the cranium. So you're thinking in three dimensions here as you're stacking, just like you did with foreground, middle ground, and background. Option Command T can tilt them. 
And it's nice because I have where the raccoon's ears came out as a nice indication for where the direction should be for those ears. And I think this is pretty, pretty much right on. If anything, I'll make this, I'll distort it so that this side of the ear is a little bit bigger because that's a little bit closer to the viewer. So you can have a lot of fun warping, distorting, skewing these organic structures, just like you did with your vector shapes when you made your emoji, right? It's the same tools, the same free transform tools. And because it's Pixabay, they're all going to be high quality, at least where they're in focus. Notice how that raccoon loses focus right at, pretty quickly at the edges. So now I've got all the head pieces together except for the mustache. So this is an engine with a lot of components, right? And that mustache is going to go in front of the muzzle. And this was from Pixabay, which makes me wonder if it's actually from AI. I didn't check. Because usually you won't see pictures of humans too much on Pixabay because there's extra rights when it's someone's likeness. But I'm just stealing the mustache, so I think I'll be okay, even if it was illegally. Yeah, yeah. Even if it was illegally put on uh, on Pixabay without this man's consent. You do have image rights. You only lose your image rights to your own likeness if you are a public figure. So politicians give up their image rights so that people can do, you know, caricatures of them and all that. You can't run for public office and retain your image rights. Yeah, it's in our constitution. It's under. If you're a public figure, you can't complain about how people represent you. Now that's different than libel. Libel is, you know, a denigrating image. And that's, that's different than caricature as protected under the First Amendment. But, but I'm not a lawyer. There's just a lot to it. So then stretching this mustache, that's going to give me, I want the hair coming right out of those nostrils. That's going to give me the, uh, the more fantasy aspect. So it doesn't just look like a human's mustache. This is our fantasy mustache. All right, so I've got, that's great. I've got all those components. None of them are colored or light corrected, but they're all rough cut and placed. And now that I've got the head, I'm gonna select all of those layers. It's made of one, two, three, four, five layers, all just in the head. I'm gonna hold down shift, select them all, and I'm gonna click on the little folder icon that's next to the new layer icon at the bottom of the layer window. And that's gonna put them all into one organizational folder, which is great because it allows me to move them all together, whoops, as long as I have auto select turned off, <laughs> I can select the whole folder, move them all together, and I can even free transform them all together, which is very helpful. Okay, so at this point I'm gonna save, because I've got my head. Oh, I should also label my folder, head. And then I'll save again, Command S, because I've already named it. And I can make sure I know where it's saving. And there it is. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the assignment and re remind you that you can always shortcut to the assignment from the home page without having to go through all the units or the modules just by clicking on assignments. And what's nice about clicking there is you'll have some other resources to help you think about the assignment. So for this one, we have from a presentation from a past student, uh, the concept work of R.J. Palmer. And R.J. Palmer started as just an amateur posting on their own social media, their digital art interest, which happened to be a lot of speculative anatomy so very inspired by films like Jurassic Park, he really wanted to understand 
how to build the anatomy of extinct creatures from bones through muscle and tissue and sinew all the way to, to the skin. And so he started building what he called rigorous anatomical uh, digital files. These are not 3D models like you would use in special effects. These are exactly like what we're doing, compositing in 2D. So this is like a little animation that he posted to make every creature of the design as believable as possible, which is what we are trying to do with our landscapes, with our fantasy creatures. And to do that, you really need to understand how these structures come together. A T-Rex is so weird because its collarbone is so small and its pelvis is so huge. That's why we believe they're related to birds, because birds actually have a breastbone that is an extension of their pelvis to help support all the, the breast muscles needed for flight, right? So this is just like a bird without any of those breast muscles. Mysteries upon mysteries. So then you can take that creature and you can composite it into any background you like, make it match. That's what a creature concept asset is all about. We'll be doing that with our own creatures. So then he started doing it with other kind of uh, prehistoric and extinct animals. And it's at this point called speculative anatomy because we don't know what colors they were. We don't know what textures they had. There's a lot of research that goes into it. And then he applied that knowledge to fantasy creatures, right? And this is pretty similar to the Western dragon design, except for this necessary, like, well, maybe tail <laughs> architecture with the extended spines from the, from the vertebrae. But uh, this is pretty similar to what you'll see in Game of Thrones or any, any media that takes dragons really seriously, where anatomy needs to work. Right, So you'll notice that it has the same kind of breastbone that a bird would have, but instead of supporting the muscles going underneath in the pectoralis major muscles to support the arms, it is instead overlapping over the top of the collarbone to support secondary shoulder joints where the shoulder blades would be. And that's how you can have both wings based on a bird and forearms, kind of taken from the T-Rex. And then he found that the best way to actually get really believable anatomy was to sculpt it, even in the most rudimentary form. So he just used pipe cleaners and sculpt these skeletal structures out of pipe cleaner. So you can understand what parts are rigid, like the rib cage, the pelvis, the cranium, what parts are dynamic, like the mandible, the waist, the neck the tail. And wings are just another structure like a hand. They're just a, an elongated hand with connective tissue. Then he applied it to 2D animation designs. And he was trying to get, you know, freelance concept work. And this same concepts work, even if it's going to be flat design versus live action design. So then this was the project that really got him noticed on his social media. He started taking Pokemon design seriously and thinking about how to make them more believable than just their 2D animated versions and other pop culture he was interested in, like H.R. Geiger's Aliens design, which is based on Beatles, um, doing fan art, really kind of playing up all the different variations you can have studying insect anatomy. And this was the project that went all over kind of deviant art and got him noticed. And he would take some of the most popular Pokemon and do the evolutions of them as believably as possible. Compositing from things like plants and from things like reptiles. And even using some of that speculative anatomy that he figured out for dragons to apply to characters like Charizard. And it looks a little weird, but that's what it's needed to support these wings. Now, that's to say these wings would in no way support flight, you know, for this creature. But it still shows how he can actually control those wings and have those arms at the same time. 